Welcome to Zoom and Vroom with the Polk County History Center. Today, we are exploring history's ultimate keepers of time and memory, Polk County's historic cemeteries. Today's program will journey quietly among the hallowed grounds that have served as final resting places for revered individuals and beloved family. In preparation for today's Zoom and Vroom program, please have on hand your Zoom and Vroom packet and a sense of adventure. Everybody ready? We'll go live in three, two, one. Hello everyone and welcome to Zoom and Vroom, live from the PG TV studio. My name is Jamie Jamison and I am the Curator of Education and Visitor Engagement at the Polk County History Center. But more importantly, on the second Saturday of each month, I transform into your Polk County History and Heritage Fairy Godmother. A little housekeeping before we begin, we expect the program to last approximately 35 minutes. Can't stay with us that long? That's okay. You can catch us on repeat through PGTV's YouTube page or any time on Facebook. Cemeteries may be our most recognizable monument to the departed, but have they always been places of quiet contemplation? Not really. At one point, cemeteries served as the only planned green space in a community and functioned much as a city park does today. Did you know that the oldest continuously maintained cemetery in the United States is the Miles Standish Burial Ground? The Miles Standish Burial Ground is in Massachusetts near the first American settlement at Plymouth. In fact, many of the Mayflower pilgrims are buried there, including the cemetery's namesake, Captain Miles Standish. Can you think of the oldest settlement in Florida? You got it? <laughs> if you said St. Augustine, you'd be correct. And it's where you can find Florida's oldest continuously maintained burial ground. Tolomato Cemetery, a Spanish mission whose burials, including Gaia peoples who converted to Catholicism, runaway slaves, and historic individuals from Spain, Haiti, Cuba, and Majorca, as well as both Union and Confederate soldiers for the American Civil War. So, what is the oldest continuously maintained in cemetery in Polk County, you may ask? Well, if you remember from our previous episode, Fort Meade is the county's oldest continuous settlement. So we look toward the burial of Winifred Marin Parker, who passed in 1856. Hers was surely not the first burial along the trail from Fort Brooke in Tampa to Fort Meade, but segregated burial grounds and scarcity of records prior to the 1900s give little reliable information. Of course, all of these recognized burial grounds are superseded in history by the burial practices of indigenous tribes in Central Florida, including those of the Alife, Calusa, Hororo, Timaqua, Tokobaga, Seminole, and Miccosukee. The first Polk Countyans were small farmers, a few storekeepers, and cattlemen. Live oaks throughout Florida were preserved for the U.S. Navy for shipbuilding but the Navy also needed tar and turpentine, thus beginning a boom of turpentine stills countywide. The same magnificent stands of longleaf pines tapped for their sap provided a serene backdrop for many of Polk's earliest burials. Maternal and infant deaths were a frequent and stark reality of pioneer life, so much so that a man might marry several times and bury wives in several places. He, in turn, might be placed by his children in still another location. Today's municipal and commercial cemeteries are a far cry from the piney wood spaces and the wooden slab markers. Funeral homes and florists, as well as monument workers, have made entombment an art form. In the 1920s, A.M. Siegler Sr. of Mulberry earned only the seventh 
license issued in Florida to operate a funeral home. When a record book published for meticians became available in about 1928, he began the formal recording of all of the information of the people that he had cared for. This book has been copied for the Historical and Genealogical Library at the Polk County History Center. Bartow's Oak Hill Cemetery is awash with the memory of Polk pioneers laid to rest between a canopy of live oak trees. The Polk County History Center invites you to join us on a guided tour of Bartow's Oak Hill Cemetery on the first Saturday of each month between October and April. So much can be learned by visiting cemeteries. The History Center's guided tour includes historic landmarks across Bartow, an introduction to historical burial practices, and the real life stories about the people buried at Oak Hill who were important to the early success of Polk County. For more information or to book a special tour for your group, feel free to call the History Center or visit us online. We look forward to seeing you. The concept of the funeral as we know it was once part of the profession of woodworking and craftsmanship associated with furniture companies. The Emporium Furniture Store in Bartow, L.W. Cowdery Furniture in Lakeland, and Success Furniture in Mulberry all sold caskets and provided embalming services when requested. Generally, individuals were buried within 24 hours, but as families became scattered, embalming allowed funerals to be delayed until everyone could gather in one place. Let's meet some of the individuals who have defined funeral home and mortuary practices in Polk County. Early memories of Wirtz Furniture Store in Bartow include hearse carriages being pulled by the most beautiful horses in town, plumed black horses for adults, and small Shetland ponies for children. Henry Pasco Whitten worked for Mr. J.L. Wirt hitching the horses to the hearse, picking up the deceased, and loading the caskets. In 1924, he earned a professional degree in embalming and opened a funeral home in a small green house at Summerlin and Jackson Streets in Bartow. Carlton Marsh apprenticed with Mr. Whitten and later opened his own funeral home in Fort Meade. J. L. Wirt's brother, Theron, established a business in Winter Haven that later became Ott Laughlin. H. E. Draper owned the first funeral home in Lake Wales, which is now Marion Nelson. Smith Dukes, later Duke Steen Funeral Home, started in the 1920s in Lakeland. In 1928, George Henry Gauze Sr. opened Gauze Funeral Home in Bartow. Gentry Morrison of Lakeland began in 1932. Haines City's Lane Holt was established in 1933. My name is Charlotta Saab, and I was born in Bartow. I'm George Saab, and I was also born in Bartow, Florida. This is a family business. I'm third generation. My grandmother and grandfather moved here from Wilmington, North Carolina in the 1920s and started the business here. When they first came to Florida from North Carolina during the Depression, my uncle in St. Petersburg had a funeral home, and it was Mac Ray funeral home in St. Petersburg. And he encouraged them to come to Bartow. When they first came here, they, uh, they opened up a grocery store. Not on, uh, it's Martin Luther King now, it was Palmetto Street. And eventually they saw the need, and they were encouraged, as I said, by our uncle in St. Pete, that we should, uh, they should get into uh, open up a funeral home, because there was a need in this area. The Gosses, they had four children, and my mother was one of them, and George Goss was my mother's twin. And uh, when they were small, he died. That left her holding the bag, trying to raise four children, and uh, she was able to be strong enough to continue on with the funeral business with uh, the best she could. And uh, 
We built this location here in 1949. Early, early in the night, in the, it had to be in the 40s. My uncle, he was in the military, and when he came home, it was understood that he would be here with his mother to run the funeral home. And my mother, which is his twin, uh, Evelyn, she was working for Central Life Insurance Company, uh, doing door-to-door -door insurance, uh, which was a great need for this area. And, it, uh, and she worked that, she did that for 50, over 50 years. And upon her retirement, uh, she was here full time after George Goss died. She was here with, uh, with my, I was assisting her uh, run the business. We had kids playing around and we had basketball goals when I was growing up so everybody kind of played in the backyard of the funeral home and, and they would do little devilish things like come hide in the casket room and you know, kids will be kids and that's what we were. And uh, it was very interesting. And as I got older, it was my job. I was in ninth or 10th grade. Uh, it was my job to get some of my playmates and we dug graves. And we set up the tents and the grave sites for funerals. And that was, that was my job. But it was very interesting uh, because it wasn't something that I wanted to do because I didn't like to wear suits. <laughs> and I had no problem digging the graves on Saturday or Friday or Sunday, most of our funerals during that period, they were held on Sundays. And, uh, but uh, I had no, no clue that I would eventually come into the business. And my grandmother, she always would kind of slyly mention to me that uh, she would love for me to become uh, a part of the business, but she never pushed me. She wanted me to make up my mind because she indicated that if, if I didn't want it, 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 you know, I would not do a good job. I was working at Campbell Soup in Camden, New Jersey, and, uh, and I woke up one morning, I was working with the engineers when they were doing the SpaghettiOs and meatballs, and that was my job to set up the grease and whatnot for the engineers. They were trying to uh, fine tune the, the, the meatballs and the SpaghettiOs and whatnot. So I woke up one morning, and the snow was up to my knee. That sent me to Florida. That told me it's time to come home and go to mortuary school, and that was in December. So I called my grandmother and told her I was ready. And, uh, and we made the arrangements to Miami Dade Junior College, and I came here, and I think I stayed here two days, and I kept going right to Miami uh, to mar mortuary school and, uh, and stayed down there and finished my, uh, my education down there and got my uh, mortuary degree. Well, one thing besides uh, embalming classes, we have anatomy, microbiology, accounting, uh, English. So all, a lot of your basic courses that you would normally get in any profession. Business law. Business law, of course, we have to do that. And once you complete your two and a half, two and a half years in, in the junior college, during the time that I came through, we had to do one year of apprenticeship as a in Bomber, once you took your test, passed the bombing test, then you had to take another year of apprenticeship uh, as a funeral director. And that's what I, I was able to complete both, both, and so I'm a licensed in Bomber and funeral director. And that's what, it, that's what it takes. And I was fortunate enough to have my uncle, he was very, he was, a, he was a good teacher, and he taught me all the ins and outs of the embalming procedure and, you know, how to do things in the prep room, so that was very helpful for me. And my mother, on the other hand, she mainly handled the books. She taught me that part of the business, so that was... So they, I had a team teaching me, and the number one thing that they taught me when we were having services is never be late. And uh, I've been brainwashed today to that fact, and it's a known in the community that Sab believes in being on time. <laughs> well, I came into the business when I married him. We got married in 1995, and it was him that encouraged me to get my funeral director's license. So that in, in itself was a challenge because by training, I'm an attorney. It never dawned on me that I would go in to get a funeral director's license. But you know, when you marry a man, you also marry his career. Now today I teach school. I'm a high school teacher at Winter Haven High School. 
but I also have my funeral director's license too. And that way, when we have multiple services, he can take one and I take one. And so it helps out that way. Goss has buried my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather. I was not a stranger to the name, but um, it was later once we got together that it became a reality to me. Uh, you're in the funeral business now, darling. <laughs> You know, you're in the funeral business, so it was. It just became natural, just trying to help him, because a, a lot of times he's he gets very busy, especially after his mom died. So I was just here to help, help pitch in, do what we women do when we have to. Well, you know, dying, living, and dying. We all living, and we all gonna die. You know no matter how long we think we're gonna be here, you know, we're gonna die. And when we do, you wanna have someone, someone you trust to take your loved one and take care of your loved one. Most of our services are burials. So they wanna make sure that we do everything that we can to make their loved ones look good in that casket. Mr. Saab is the best in the business. That's one of the reasons he receives uh, some of the awards he gets from the Florida Funeral Directors Association because he is out, he's an outstanding embalmer. He's very good at what he does. And they all admire him. And I just am so proud of him because I just sit back and watch the accolades they throw at him. You know, everyone in the community who our families who use us, they realize that what we bring to their family, no one else can do it. And so that's why they call Gauss when there's a need. They hope they don't have to call us, but when they do, you know, when they have a loved one that dies, they call us. Both of us, we've lost our parents and what have you, so that's, that's a rough, that's, that's one of the baddest days in your life, I would say. And uh, you need some, you need to be there, and you gotta have somebody that has compassion and be able to guide them through this professionally. And, uh, and also, like I said, with compassion. I know it's a business, but uh, you, you, you still have to have that compassion and do, do a professional job. Believed to be Polk County's oldest continually maintained black cemetery, Evergreen is the final resting site for many influential Polk Countyans, including Dr. Oshin Sweet, a prominent physician and Howard University graduate who was connected with attorney Clarence Darrow during the Civil Rights Movement, former enslaved pioneers Prince Johnson, Andy Moore, and his wife Tamer Reed Moore, who all became influential founders in the city of Bartow, L.B. Brown, former enslaved person who was a prominent architect and both designed and owned the L.B. Brown home. Veterans from the Spanish-American War through the Vietnam War, including Captain Donald Woodruff, Staff Sergeant Jesse Ernest Nixon, Clarence W. Mitchell, and Private Jesse Thomas, who served with the Armed Expeditionary Forces Veterinary Hospital No. 22 during World War I.
you can find out more about the cemeteries across Polk County by visiting the Polk County Historical and Genealogical Library and by searching the popular Find a Grave database. Let's visit with Preston to find out more about the available resources. Resources available for researching cemeteries, funeral homes, and burial records are available at the Polk County Historical and Genealogical Library, and they include both print and digital tools. The best place to start is with the Imperial Polk Genealogical Society's Cemetery Survey Records. Encompassing nine volumes, the books explore the known cemeteries in the county and list both the descriptions of and the directions to the cemetery in addition to the names and plot locations of people buried there. The county probate records provide information about an individual's estate and last will and testament. From this, researchers can learn more about the types of property someone owned, where they lived, if they had any children, what type of work they might have done, and so much more. The library also has the record books for the Crisp Coon Funeral Home in Winter Haven and the A.E. Siegler Funeral Home in Mulberry. In addition to providing information on specific individuals, the records provide fantastic insight on the types of services offered from as early as 1926 and the cost of those services. In addition, visitors to the Historical Library can work with our Special Collections Assistant and our Research and Genealogy Historian to find obituaries published in newspapers and archived on microfilm. You can even access some of our records from the comfort of your own home. Preserved in our digital collection, Family Bibles provide information that is not found anywhere else. They can also help you confirm information that you are not 100% sure about. Most of the Bibles in our collection date back to the mid-19th century and can be accessed by visiting our website and selecting Family Bibles from the digital catalog. In recognition and in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, let's join Ana Rivera in learning more about Dia de los Muertos. Hola, yo soy Anita Rivera de Que Pasa Polk, and today we're going to be celebrating something that is annual, and it's called El Dia de los Muertos. It's a holiday celebrated by Mexico and elsewhere associated with the Catholic celebrations of All Saints Day, and it's held on November the 1st through the 2nd. In 2008, UNESCO recognized the tradition as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And today, I have a special reading for you. It is from the book Dia de los Muertos, and the author is Roseanne Greenfeld Thong, and the artist is Carlos Ballesteros. So let me read a little bit of this book, this special book for you. So it's Dia de los Muertos, the sun's coming round as niños prepare in each pueblo and town. For today, we will honor our dearly departed with celebrations, celebraciones. It's time to get started. At home, we've adorned our altares with care. They're heaped with recuerdos and good things to share. Sweet calabares, so sugary and white. They give to thee smiles, but never a fright. A black and white photo of Grandpa Padilla, who's riding on horseback just like Pancho Villa. 
and to the toys and the toys for remembering small angelitos, a train and a dollhouse are both favoritos. And you can see the pictures here. Nice and colorful, I love it, I love it. Then off to the graveyard we head with ofrendas and colorful blankets to make meriendas. We carry incensio and velas to burn that will guide spirits back for their yearly return. So if you want to know a little bit more about El Dia de los Muertos, just head to your local library and there's plenty of books talking about this and special stories for you to share with your friends and family. Again, I'm Anita Rivera with Que Paso Polk here in room reading for you today, El Dia de los Muertos. All right, well, I think you are ready to zoom out of here and start exploring. Be sure to pick up the driving tour card at the History Center or request a PDF copy to be emailed to you. Traveling with kids? Make sure to stag a Zoom in Room adventure pack to accompany your drive this month. It includes a skeleton mermaid and a fun Halloween eraser wind-up toy. We hope you enjoyed discovering the ways in which we have historically honored our departed. Have a very happy Halloween and don't forget to think of the ancestors who came before you. Make sure to join us next time on November 13th for Notable Neighborhoods, Homesteads, and Main Street in Polk County. Happy trails! <laughs>